Welcome, everybody. This is the Life Enthusiast Online Radio and TV Network coming to you on Facebook Live today. We're very, very excited. We are broadcasting to um, our fibromyalgia group, which, have, which has over 25,000 members. We're very excited to see how this all works. I'm Scott Patton. He's Martin Patella. Oops, wrong way. Martin Patella over here. Hi, Martin. How are, you, how are you doing today? Hi, Scott. Hi, everyone who cares to hear. I don't know. This is the first time, so we're, I feel like a virgin all over again. <laughs> awesome. So our mission is to restore vitality to you and to the planet. And so we started our fibromyalgia group up. We've had a great response. Uh, there's a couple of things that I just wanted, as this is our first um, kind of uh, Facebook Live in the group to point out, and that is in the group uh, description, we have a link to our seven-day challenge, and that's something that kind of has gotten lost. One of the things that we strongly recommend people do is look at what they're putting into their mouths and how that impacts their life, and in particular, things like uh, flour, gluten, um, not drinking enough water. And so we put together the seven-day challenge so that we would ask you one day to not eat a certain type of food and see what happens, see how that impacts you and see how that affects you. And uh, one day is not enough, but if it gives you a bit of a clue, like if ah, I don't feel quite as painful or as achy as I usually do, then maybe try it for three days. And then if after three days you notice, wow, write it down because it's really easy to forget and then don't take that food in anymore. There's lots of food in the world and lots of water in the world and everything else. And if you aren't taking in all the sugar or all the white starchy uh, things or gluten stuff that uh, can cause problems with inflammation, uh, then all of a sudden maybe your, your pain goes down 2% or 10% or 50% or maybe it's all gone. Who knows? But if you don't try these things, uh, it's not, it's not going to work. Uh, you're just because that's what everybody in the group says is I tried this. It doesn't work. I've tried that. It doesn't work. And of course, the majority of things that people are trying are prescription drugs and the horror stories that our members are saying about how hard it was to get off of the drugs are actually addicted to them or how painful, uh, you know, the, oh, it helped with, you know, my shoulder pains, but I had all these other things that were worse. So the net result is not always improvement. And typically with fibromyalgia or anything else in the world, it's not one thing. But what we want to do is we want you to start thinking about the most, you know, I guess what you put in your mouth has a huge impact on how you feel. And if you don't believe me, guzzle three beer and see what happens. So that's where we need to start. And then we sort of from there, you sort of look at other things, whether it's exercise, the environment that you're in, mold that maybe is in your environment, the air that you breathe, the water that you drink. Um, I, f I follow uh, Aaron Brockovich, who is for decades has been fighting for clean water in the United States. And the stories that she posts every day are horrific when it comes to water. Like there's lead in the, the water that the kids are drinking at school, or there's this long, long, long chemical name that, that people are, are, are finding in their water. And, and of course, the, the, the story that she constantly tells is of the water officials not doing anything and covering all this stuff up. So there's a lot of possible reasons why you are the way that you are, and not all of them are your fault. And so we want to do the seven day challenge so that you can start getting into the habit of taking food out of your diet and waiting a day and seeing if you feel better or you feel worse. Because maybe that Coca Cola that you like to have every day is causing a lot of your problems. So you can then choose to be in pain or you can choose to not have whatever that substance is that's causing your pain. And at least then you're in control as opposed to being the victim and saying, you know, because it's one thing to say, you know what, I know when I have Coca-Cola, the next day I'm in bed and I'm in pain and I'm in agony. And but last night was a special night and I really wanted to have that Coca-Cola. So I'm going to put up with it. That's a lot different than, oh, my God, I feel terrible today. I don't know why I drank three Coca-Colas last night, but I don't think that had anything to do with it. And now you're a victim. So what we want to do is we want you to move you along that spectrum. And it's amazing the difference that, that happens. 
The other thing that we want to talk about, it's there's been a lot of conversation in the group lately about uh, CBD oils and um, Krakotome? Kratin. <laughs> Kratin. <laughs> I'd never heard of it before so people started bringing it up. So what we want to do is we want to talk about uh, those two things. And we also have a uh, product that an herbalist that's been making herbal concoctions forever uh, has put together specifically for people that suffer from fibromyalgia. Now, a lot of people say they have fibromyalgia and they have something else. This is for a very specific group of people in the fibromyalgia world. So, uh, Martin, where do you want to start? Well, I want to jump in on where you were talking about the um, seven-day challenge. When we put it together, we wanted to make it short just so that people would think that it's easy, but it's not. And it's not one day. Like, for instance, gluten stays in your system for at least four and oftentimes till 10 days. So when we tell you stop eating bread and wait to see what happens, some of us feel it right away, but some of us take a few days for it to clear. And so the problem is that it's a seven-day challenge, but each of the days should last about a week. Right. Yeah. But, and you're right. Like what we did is we just picked one day because we wanted to, we figured you could, we could all do without something for one day. It, if we said, well, we want you to do without, without for four days or for seven days. Now all of a sudden our seven day challenge is a seven week challenge and it can be a little bit overwhelming. We want to take baby steps and we want you to start thinking in terms of maybe some of the stuff I'm putting in my body is working with other things that are in my body or in the air or in my environment, or it could be mental, uh, mental and emotional too. Like I'm very, very stressed out. Those are things that also impact the body uh, tremendously, right? So, you know, maybe it's, you know, do a day without stress or maybe just start doing rather than that, which I don't know how you could do. Uh, I'm, you do a day where you spend 15 minutes in meditation, get a nice quiet, uh, whether it's waves or music, and just have that quiet time. Oftentimes it will take more than just one day to wear down all of that stress. The good thing is that people can ask us questions. As, as they type them, we see them. So, right. for instance, just a moment ago, I saw a question go by, which was, does barometric pressure affect the flares? Right. So and let's ask that question. Yes, let's do that. So the simple answer is yes. The complicated answer is this. Your immune system is like a, uh, liken it to a bucket. Like if you have a bucket, a tank that holds your capacity to deal with things, um, when you add to the bucket, when it rains or when you pour something on top of it, either it will hold in the bucket or it will splash all over. And when you put rocks in the bucket, and these rocks will represent the various stressors, the various uh, impediments that you have, either unique to you or that exist in the environment or that exist everywhere, the more blobs you have in the bucket, the less water it will take for it to splash all over. So the barometric pressure is just one of these sort of things that when a storm is coming on, you know about it three days ahead. You can predict the weather better than anyone else. And the other environmental things that are hard to control is uh, the temperature, the humidity, the noise from your neighbors, um, I, I was going to that are hard to. I was going to say street noises, you know, <laughs> sirens going by, and and that sort of thing, also. Yeah, all those. So that's that stuff you can do very little about. Your crying infant or your uh, belligerent somebody, whatever. But the things that you can control are the things that we have tried to put into the seven day challenge and. We, we have four categories. We have toxicity, malnutrition, 
stagnation and trauma, and even past trauma that is embedded in you, emotional or physical trauma that you have suffered, can be undone with various methods. We have highlighted EFT, emotional freedom technique, with a couple of interviews that we have in the group. And we have also introduced uh, Dr. Michael Amendolara with his uh, rapid pain elimination techniques, which can very easily, well, not easily, but effectively discharge, dislodge, and erase the emotional trauma that is causing the subconscious response that creates the immune system reacting with pain. So those are the invisibles. Right. So we have another question that just came up, which is, are there any new meds coming to the market, new treatment options? And I think this is an important question because there's a philosophical divide that occurs in that, you know, one of the things that we think when we look at the medical profession is they're very good at emergency work. You break your leg, man, oh, man, I want to go to emergency. And I want them to do their thing because they can have a heart attack or my, you know, a brain tumor or, or some emergency. They're really good. Where they have a problem, unfortunately, is in lifestyle and chronic disease. And so they keep, you know, we... The problem isn't a Band-Aid and there's no quick fix. We've taken a long time to get to this position in our life and it's going to take us a while to get out of it if we start doing the right things, which is usually the opposite of the things that we've been doing. What I would like to say is there's a major difference between acute and chronic. Acute is I just broke my leg or I just had a bullet wound or I have... uh, I had a very high fever that's causing me dramatic, traumatic trouble. So that is an acute problem. And for that, the Western uh, emergency room medicine is working exceedingly well. And I want them to be there for that. But when it comes to chronic problem, that's something like the fibromyalgia, or high blood pressure, or I could go on a long litany of uh, illnesses that they try to fix or heal, but they can only treat. And there is a major difference between cure and treatment. They have all kinds of treatments, like pregabalamin, which is known as Lyrica, is a treatment for fibromyalgia. But what they treat is the nervous system. Originally, they designed this drug for seizures, to limit seizures. So they found that there is some way of screwing around with the brain so it doesn't react the way it normally reacts. And they found that some of the people do not experience their pain as strongly when they're taking this drug. It solves nothing. It doesn't do anything about the reason why this pain rises but you don't feel as much of it. There is a high price for it because it's poisoning you as you go on. And so the more toxic you get, the more likely you will have further complications later in life. So to answer the question, are there any new meds? Regardless whether they introduce new meds or not, if they are introduced from the perspective of treatment, They solve nothing. They may give you a temporary reprieve. You can take a painkiller for your headache, but you have done nothing about the cause of the headache. So when you're over your headache for today, I can promise you that that headache is coming back. That's the nature of migraines. They keep coming back when the stimuli pile up high enough that the bucket splashes over. Scott? Right. So another question we've got from Peggy is why are doctors only paying attention to our lab tests? And uh, Uh, let me answer that. The quick answer is, of course, that's all that they have. Like they really don't know. Like we put the doctors in an almost impossible situation when you think about it. Right. Like we go to the doctor. He looks at us. He says, I don't know. So then what happens? We get mad at them and we say, no, like you're the doctor. I'm in pain or I have a problem. You need to solve it. 
So then they go, well, I don't know. Uh, let's try this drug. And then you try the drug. You come back a couple of weeks later. You say, I feel worse or I feel better or whatever. And it's, well, let's up the dose. Let's down the dose. Let's try a different drug. And so you become like this guinea pig. And they, the problem that if fibromyalgia had a marker in the blood, like uh, a lot of diseases do, then they would just look at it and say, oh, you've got hepatitis C. Here's what you do, right? But it, there is no marker in the blood. So they do all of these tests. And because there's nothing in there and they've been trained to say, to believe that if the blood tests come back right, you're fine. That's the logic that they use. And unfortunately, that's not the case, obviously not the case because we're all in pain. And so, but they have nothing else to do. All they can do is take your blood and they can test for all these different things. And at the end of that, they say, well, uh, there's nothing wrong with you. <laughs> we know there is, but it's when not an acute problem. Yeah, when your tests come back with either normal or not normal, it really has no bearing on whether it is or isn't making your health worse. Most of the time, you're going to be within the reference range. And the reference range is something that says the population in large or at large is, uh, let's just pick something, TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, you're supposed to be between number two and number eight. So if you're above eight, you're over the limit and now you have a problem and whatever. If you're under two, there's probably not enough stimulation, whatever. That's just a number. The, uh, the thing is that if you have a thyroid problem, you will be waking up cold or you will be feeling cold in the evening, you will be experiencing uh, weight gain or inability to lose weight, you will be moody, and I don't know, I could go on for a long list, your hair will start looking really crappy and whatnot, or you will start getting this sort of thing, see here, see how my eyebrows are fading out? They're supposed to be thick all the way out, but mine are only halfway. That is a sign of thyroid not working right it took me so long to find out that i can't get it back i mean i can manage it but i no longer qualify as a healthy person and the reason i'm in this business is because i'm not a healthy person is it because it is because i'm one of you anyway so i want to finish on the um, point about treatment or did i beat it to death scott I, I would say that you beat it to death, Martin. Um, okay, so let me answer a question. Yes, we do have a question from Heather. What is your opinion of uh, lidocaine infusions or injections? And I have no clue what that even means. Okay, yeah. So let me answer a different question before I answer that. And could you just mute me, mute me out? Um, so there was, just before this one, there was another question that was, can you explain about substance P? And that's a substance P that has to do with how pain is transmitted through the nervous system. And it discusses all the fine, minute details of how this neurotransmitter translates into another neurotransmitter and so on. It deals with the glutamine, glutamate, and what goes on in the brain and so on. And this is what the Western medical science is so good at. They can really get into the minutia of uh, how things work. But they do not ask, why do they happen? So I can explain to you everything about the broken in, uh, fuel injection in your engine without ever discussing the fact that you bought crappy fuel that has clogged it up. And so the, the approach is that we do not try to dwell so much on trying to explain the engineering, the science, the medical, the whatever. Instead, we try to focus on, and why is that? What did it? What happened? So let me go back to the lidocaine injections. Uh, in my days when I had... Uh, I had uh, plantar fasciitis and I had carpal tunnel syndrome in my early days. And so I went to a doctor, orthopedic surgeon, and they squirted me with, um, what is it called? Hydrocortisone injection. And for six weeks, 
I was free of pain. And then, of course, the cortisone wore off, and I was in as much, if not more, pain than I was before. The lidocaine is a similar idea. Lidocaine is a painkiller. So when you inject the lidocaine in a, into specific body sites in small doses, it will completely overcome the pain receptors and it will calm things down. So you will have a while, uh, not a very long while, few weeks of peace and relative stability. Maybe if you do that, you should use that time when you're not feeling so much pain to try and figure out what gets you there. Uh, but that my answer would be, don't worry about those treatments. Focus on the causes. Right. So here we have an interesting question about spinal surgery. So if you've had spinal surgery, what is the percentage that develop fibro? And oh, God. There is actually... A, no, 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 no. There actually is a code, a diagnostic code in the books that says failed back surgery. The percentage of failed back surgeries is so high that they actually have it as a cause of illness or as a, as a legitimate illness. It's just very, very sad. And I mean, I was facing that problem back in my 20s when I fell apart. I, I was really bad, right? Like if you don't read my story, I'll just tell it to you short. I would have periods that would last three, four weeks when I would just fall apart and I would be sleeping in my rocking chair face down with my head on the footrest because that was the only position I could sleep in. And I would roll off of that on the floor and crawl on all fours to the toilet to do my business there because I could not stand upright. upright. And uh, so I would somehow get myself to a chiropractor and they would sort of put me back together and I would after a couple of weeks of horrendous pain, have just the occasional sort of maybe manageable pain. Anyway, so one of the avenues I could have followed at that point would have been back surgery, which would have mechanically tried to eliminate the breakdown. What happens is you have the vertebrae, and between the vertebrae you have these discs. The disc material sort of sits between. And when you squish it hard, it kind of leaks out to the side. And um, when it leaks out to the side, it pushes on a nerve, and that causes pain and whatever, shooting pain down the legs or elsewhere. And uh, they think this is permanent, and they don't know how to fix it, so they try to cut it out, or they try to um, create an immo immovable. They fix the two of these vertebrae instead of being able to move against one another, they just fix them with a plate or nails or whatever. So when it's tied together into a single block, then at least it stops the pain in the spot, but it solved nothing. So of course, that was a wonderful uh, tirade about promoting non-surgery, except now that you've had your surgery, um, the question was, will it cause the fibro? No, not directly. The fibro is caused by, as we list it, malnutrition, stagnation, toxicity, and trauma. There always is a viral infection involved. Most often it's Epstein-Barr, but oftentimes it's herpes or some other, one of the 600 different viral infections that qualify. And the toxic load. And... Uh, all right, we're going to go on to our next question, which is, uh, it may seem like a, it, there are no stupid questions, and this actually is a great question. Why does fibro affect our sex lives, even though we have days with little or no pain? Oh, boy. So the fibro itself is a uh, uh, condition of degrees. So you could have, a spe it's a spectrum, just like you hear about autistic spectrum, where you could be mildly ADD and uh, a little bit of Asperger, all the way to curled up in fetal position in the corner of a room, banging your head on the wall. Likewise with fibro, you can have uh, anything from the occasional headache, to occasional backache, to 
screaming pain that you want to kill yourself right now because it's just so bad you just don't know if you can take another hour of it or a day of it or whatever. So the fibro will go in and out, and it will go in and out based on the um, how full your bucket is. And whatever fills your bucket is different for everybody else. Like my, my uh, limiting experience was getting toxic with mercury. I had 12 mercury fillings put in my face. That's what took me out of my healthy life into the life of pretty awful. So whatever yours are, you need to get them out of your life. It could be food. It could be emotion. It could be air, water. Whatever you can control is the ones that we're trying to, try to teach you about. Uh, so all about the sex life. Enjoy it while you can. <laughs> because there will be days when you can't get... I mean, there are thousands of people here on this group that will tell you that they don't want to be touched. They can't stand to be touched. Oh, so a bit of physiology. So histamine is the molecule that is the signaling molecule for the inflammation. Um, so redness, like, for instance, a blush on the face or whatever, that's a sure sign of histamine rising. And uh, sexual excitation is also a histamine rise. So an orgasm is actually a, is a peak. So you peak with histamine at orgasm, and then you come down off of it. And so uh, when you are already high in histamine, getting another rise in it is not all that desirable. Uh, okay, so sorry. Okay, about so that. we were on, we were, I was babbling about a migraine and I was going to go back and answer Elizabeth's question because she wanted to know about fibromyalgia and thyroid. Yes. So let's get that. So the connection between the two, there's a huge link. Um, that the, there are certain commonalities. Some things are more common than others. And the hypothyroid or hyperthyroid is very common, as is Hashimoto's. Hashimoto's is an illness, an autoimmune illness that is in the process of destroying your thyroid gland. And uh, it could be that you are over which is called Graves' disease, or under, which is called, what do they call it? Hmm. Hashimoto's, I think, is what it's called. Anyway, the point of that is that uh, that the same autoimmune uh, triggers that are triggering your uh, illness, the autoimmune response or the overreaction of the immune system that are making your connective tissue, your joints, and whatever other body parts hurt um, is also making your um, thyroid gland worse off. And so there, there are some supplements that work really well. Selenium methionate, methi, yeah, methionate is uh, great for people with Hashimoto's. The trouble we hear is that if you supplement iodine, Normal people react to it really well, where Hashimoto's don't. It's, it is said, and I don't know if this is correct, that supplementing iodine will work for a while and then uh, in the process actually wreck your thyroid. Um, somebody asked if there was a test for Hashimoto's. Um, well, there are blood tests that will reveal many things. One of them is called ANA, uh, uh, anti-nuclear antibodies, ANA. So if you have that high, that's essentially an indicator that you have an autoimmune disease of some sort. Uh, CRP, C-reactive protein, you will have that elevated and a few other things. I mean, doctors that are uh, uh, working that territory will know the answers. But we don't even bother with that because we we don't believe that we need to go after the tests. You have the symptoms, you have the disease. Work on your triggers, work on your causes. 
Um, okay, so, so anyway, a little bit now, Martin. About uh, I cannot Martin. hear you, Scott. You're muted out. You're okay. right. Sorry about that. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about what are some of the recommendations for fibromyalgia because we we have obviously the seven day challenge. We want to talk about a lot of people have been talking about CBD oil, so we want to talk a little bit about one of those, and we also want to hit on uh, the kratom. Kratom, kratom, kratom. All right. Great. Well, let's talk about recommendation. So we have posted this probably 500 times. If you uh, search on me, which is Martin Patella, you will uh, uh, find my posts and I post the report often enough. And we have posted some of this resource into the description of the group. So you can find it there. So look there. You can, uh, you can see the recommendations. Anyway, the recommendations are understand your triggers. They are different for every person. I mean, the general triggers are this. Number one, you can control your pain or at least lower your pain. And for that, the CBD is really good. CBD, cannabidiol, it's extracted from hemp. It is um, legal for us to ship around all of the United States. We have been shipping it to UK and Australia. It seems to get to the clients just fine. And what cannabidiol does, there's an endocannabinoid system in the body, which is the signaling molecule of happy and relax and calm down. Moments ago, I talked about histamine, which is the signaling molecule of irritated, unhappy, and uh, pain. So when you put in the um, cannabidiol into the system, your body actually makes its own. This is not a foreign substance to the human body. The, the endocannabinoids are already in circulation in your body. It's just that you're not making it enough or are making more histamine than that. So yes, Elizabeth, this is what people call cannabis oil or cannabidiol or CBD reacted to with these molecules. And yes, we can send it to Scotland and we can send it to England and Wales. <laughs> and um, anyway, the, the general dosage for pain is one to two milligrams at a time, three to five times a day. And that means that you will be needing between three and 10 milligrams per day so when you see our packages, we sell anywhere between 100 and 500 or 1,000 milligrams at a time. So uh, if you're a high-ish user at 10 milligrams a day, 500 would last you 50 days. Anyway, works great on pain. Works great on calming things down. And uh, yes, sure, you can, you can find it. There's somebody put the remarkable recovery up. Scott, thank you. Um, the, uh, the clearing of the load, you will be getting better off as time goes on. The longer you use it, the less of it you need. You can ingest it in just about any form. If you vape it, vaporize it, it goes in through your lungs. And so that's almost instant absorption. When you put it in your mouth and allow it to absorb through the saliva, it's a little slower, but it's still within two, three minutes. You can also swallow it in capsules or pastes or something like that. That will take about half an hour to kick in, but it will kick in. Martin, can you compare it a little bit to the, um, the K-word? Kratom. Kratom? Kratom is a botanical grown in Indonesia in tropical countries, Philippines, Indonesia, thereabouts. There are four or five different versions of it, red, white, this, that, whatever, varieties. It's essentially a natural opioid. So when you hear about opioids such as uh, Oxycontin, Vicodin, and that sort of stuff, those are opioids, and they are the strongest painkillers. Kratom is from that uh, class of 
alkaloids. So it's very good at being a painkiller. It's also anti-inflammatory because it's more natural. So you can expect it to do better than just the worst of uh, um I don't know. I just noticed something that distracted me. Um, do you guys ever talk in the UK? <laughs> I would come and pay money. <laughs> um, okay, so the, the uh, Kratom, the problem we have with it is this. It's illegal in the UK. It's uh, illegal in about seven or eight states in the United States. I remember that Alabama and Vernon, uh, not Vernon, Vermont, have banned it altogether. But the other states allow it. We have posted about it. If you go into the group and put Kratom, K-R-A-T-O-M, into the search box, you will see all the posts, including the link to the legal status. There is a fairly active group that is trying to keep Kratom legal or get it re-legalized in states that banned it. Here's the problem. Yeah, I know, no go in the UK. Um, the uh, the issue is this. The pharmaceutical companies do not like the competition from natural substances. What they like to make are patent medicines. Patent means that it's patented, that they have an exclusive right to a specific molecule um, that, um, that is not found in nature. So they look at nature and make something that's sort of like it and then try to patent it and then put it in a drug. i give you an example. Valium, which is from the same class as Xanax, it's benzodiazepine type of drug. Valium got its name from valerian root. And that's where it was isolated from and then modified and then made into a pharmaceutical. So you can actually drink valerian root tea and uh, give yourself a similar effect as you would get from taking Xanax or any other anti-anxiety drug. Of course, the weird thing is this. Anxiety is a function of imbalance in your pH in your body. So you can also control the anxiety and depression using nutrition. We can get into that. Well, as, a, as a metabolic typing advisor, I can uh, give you guidance on how you can construct your meals to match your uh, to match your genetics so that you don't experience anxiety or depression. And I think part of what Martin is talking about here, just to, to briefly get into it, is certain people can eat a certain... Have you seen kids in the grocery store that are just <coughs> yelling and screaming and carrying on? And that's because they ate something 10 minutes or an hour or half an hour before that made them massively acidic and that caused this road rage. And then you have other kids that are wandering around, they're absolutely behaving like angels. And that's because they ate something that made them more alkaline, which is generally speaking more relaxed. And just, so there are different types of foods. This is a going, again, going back to the seven day challenge. There are different types of foods that affect us differently. And so when you see somebody that has road rage, the chances are they're, their pH is more acidic than it should be, and they and it shows up in anger and and then you see these people that are just like so mellow and uh, depressed. That's because, that's they can the be opposite, depressed right? at the opposite extreme. Yeah. yeah, that's right. So Martin, just to get back, we've we've been on for about an hour and we're coming oh kind God. of to the end of our time. Uh, but we wanted to talk a little bit about a specific CBD oil. If it's okay with everybody, we've got. Uh, we got one we just wanted to show you. Do you have and one to show? I don't. You don't? No, I didn't remember. Oh, I thought you to had one. Well, I do have several, but I have to go off camera to uh, to drag it here. Okay, what about the fibro ease? It's, it's all here in the house, but I didn't remember to bring it. One of, right. one of the features of uh, having fibro, which I do have, is brain fog. And so... Um, 
when when you get a flare, you can't remember stuff. Okay, Kimberly, I can only see a very short segment, so you need to type a very short question. Um, so fiber fog, yeah, I get that. Oh, FODMAP, okay. So no, this is not FODMAP. Those are, uh, although the FODMAP foods, if you look into that, those are frequently the ones that trigger people who end up with this sort of inflammatory. So yes, you FODMAP is a method of eliminating certain specific foods. Okay, Scott is showing you a tube of um, cannabidiol, extract this one happens to be the blue rsho 18 percent uh this one is a 10 gram tube that we would be selling for somewhere around 300 dollars <coughs> oh it's, and, it's the um, only one i had that i could get to God, unmute unmute i'm am i unmute. muted you're muted Oh, no. I'm Okay. On uh, Skype, I'm muted. I was going to say, this is the only one I could get to quickly. The other ones are upstairs in my, uh, yeah. in my room. So we'll talk about this one briefly, Martin. Okay, sure. Well, so the paste. Uh, in the earliest days, could you please unmute it, Scott, again? In, in the earliest days, what we had was the raw mass, the biomass, which uh, we would extract from the hemp plant. Like we, we would start with the body of the plant, the leaves, the, st uh, the stalks, all of it. You would mush it up into some sort of a uh, green goo. And then you would use an organic solvent. You could use alcohol, naphtha, butane, hexane, something like that, and you would extract the solvable, soluble part of the uh, hemp plant, and then you would boil off the alcohol, get rid of that, and what you would be left with is that goo that we saw in that tube that Scott was showing. And that, if you concentrated, would have certain percentage of the CBD in it. And what is important is that these Products are made in such a way that they have no THC, only CBD. And that's what makes it legal for us to ship. But it also makes it fun to use because you don't get stoned. The disadvantage of regular hemp is that it has been bred mostly for getting high. And the higher the THC, the lower the CBD. And the CBD is the part that gives you the healing effect, and THC is the part that gives you the feeling stoned effect. And so it gets you stoned beautifully, but it doesn't heal you much. Whereas this stuff that, that we have is very high in CBD, very low, nearly zero THC. So you get lots of healing and you can still operate heavy machinery. You don't get stoned on it. And you can even pass drug tests while using these products. Martin, we had somebody ask a couple times about overactive yeast. So I think maybe that's where we'll kind of close off the questions and, uh, and talk a little bit about that. Sure. Uh, and then if you have, this will be available for replay, so you'll be able to watch it. If you've just joined us, you'll be able to see it from the beginning. We'll also put some links into some of the things that we've talked about uh, in the comments so that they're there for you as well. And then, uh, Based on the fact that we've had over 60 people watch and listen and a whole pile of you give uh, us questions and feedback and everything else, we're, we're going to be doing this on an ongoing basis. So this isn't just a one-off. This was just uh, we discovered this new way of communicating with you. This is our first time doing it. We hope you've enjoyed it. We've enjoyed it. And, uh, and we're going to continue if that's what you'd like. So, Martin, let's talk a little bit about overactive yeast and uh, fibromyalgia. Okay, let's do that. <clears throat> another question in that lineup was uh, about FODMAP, and another question was about IBS, and another question was about yeast. All of this relates back to eating not 
to match your genetics. Uh, your ancestors back when, before travel and before industry, were living in a fairly confined geographic environment. Let's just say they lived somewhere in Ireland near the ocean. They lived on cold water fish, limited amount of vegetables. They uh, fertilized their gardens with kelp. So they were specifically pre-selected for living on high amount of iodine, lots of cold water fish, meaning uh, um, lots of vitamin A from the fish oils and stuff like that. So now, if that's what you need, then eating the diet of an Italian farmer from the uh, northern Italy where pizza and calzone and uh, spaghetti is the norm, then you're doing yourself a horrendous disservice. And that's where this trouble comes from. So if you're eating a diet from the wrong genetic pre-selection, then you're going to make yourself ill. And the IBS, for instance, one day you have diarrhea, the next day you have constipation. The main cause of trouble there are, is, the, uh, is the bacteria, the microbiome in there. So we need to f try and fix that. We have uh, supplements. So we we could help you fix the gut. Now, the, the yeast, the yeast is your body's attempt to ferment away things that it cannot deal with any other way. So there's just simply too much carbohydrate in your diet. Um, how do we put this? You probably, I mean, the person that's asking about the yeast most likely is from the hunter genetics. So she, she, he needs to eat probably high fat, high red meat, lots of vegetables, like a steak and salad is a staple and no bread and mm, I don't know what else. You see, th this gets into individualities. There are these various dietary types and I can help you individually to help determine that. And we do have, Scott and I have recorded some webinars that explain it at length and detail you can find uh, a webinar called weight loss secrets on the podcast uh, section of the life enthusiast website life-enthusiast.com click on podcast search on weight loss um cool Scott. Yes. So we'll, uh, I, there's one thing I wanted to put in here too, is if you go to the Life Enthusiast site, you'll see a phone number. If you call the phone number, either Mark nor his wonderful wife, Maureen, will answer it. And uh, they'll put you on with Martin as soon as possible. And he can, he and you need to talk about what it is that you're, uh, you're going through to be specific. Because what's happening right now is, First of all, we've been talking for an hour and we get a bit tired. And secondly, we're, we're, we, we're getting to where we, we talk generally, but now we're getting into kind of the specifics. So we can't really say something about the yeast because we don't know the specifics of the individual. And we could be telling you the opposite depending on your gen. You know, it could be your family all came from South Asia somewhere. Or they came from Africa or they came from the Arctic Circle or or you're a mixture of all those things. So really want to, you know, encourage you to spend a little bit of time one-on-one -on -one with Martin. There's, it's not, you don't get charged for it or anything else. We're just here to help you. And um, I kind of move on from there. Now I promised someone that we would talk about fibromyalgia and blindness. So can you go blind from fibromyalgia or is this going to be something else? And then, uh, we talked about the seven-day challenge at the beginning. It's in the description of the group if you want to try the seven-day challenge. So, Martin, kind of to tie it all up, let's... Okay. Um, so somebody actually asked about lactic acidosis, which is yet another symptom. Blindness is a symptom. Pain is a symptom. So the, the point is this. Uh, fibromyalgia will not make you blind. Causes of blindness will make you blind, and causes of fibromyalgia will give you fibromyalgia. 
there are there are possibilities that you will have uh, macular degeneration if that's why your eyes are going. If it's macular degeneration, it's carotenoid problem, and I would be talking about astaxanthin as your most likely remedy. But I don't know if that's the reason why you're going blind or worried about blindness or already blind. If you're already blind, uh, it's probably not going to make it any different. Um. Okay. All right. So we're at the end. Thank you very much, everybody. If you want to continue uh, putting comments and questions in, of course, we're monitoring this. We will uh, answer your comments, ask, answer your questions in the comments. Um, this is a, is a live event in the fibromyalgia group. So the replay will be there forever for you to refer back to or watch or watch for the first time if this is the first time, even if it's years later. Um, Really want to encourage you to go to www.life-enthusiast.com. There are articles there that you can read. There are podcasts and videos there that you can watch or listen to if you choose to do that. And there's a phone number because one of the problems that we have with, with the medical system is here's a drug, try the drug. I don't know if it's going to work or, you know, we're sort of guessing at what the answer is. And, the what will work for one person could have the exact opposite effect on another person. And so part of what Martin does as your health coach is he helps you to decide, find out what we call it metabolic typing, like what type of body do you have? And are you the type of person that needs more protein and less fats or more carbohydrates and less fats or a Mediterranean diet versus a South Asian diet or whatever, and then yeah. help you back onto the correct diet. We really feel that that's the biggest thing that you can do for your health is making sure that you're drinking lots of water, eating the proper foods for your body, and then removing the toxins. One of my favorite quotes from Martin is when you're in a hole, the first thing you have to do is stop digging. And oftentimes we're eating donuts or we're drinking Coca-Cola or we're drink, eating the wrong types of foods, which cause us to dig the hole deeper, which means it's harder to get out of. And so where it really starts is finding out what type of body, your, what type of food you, and drink your body likes and works with it, as opposed to the types of foods that don't. And then from there, we can do things like C suggest CBD oils or FibroEase or other products from herbalists that we know that, that can maybe give you short-term relief so that you can then start making these changes and, uh, and kind of go from there. So we really want to thank you for taking time to watch us and listen with us and participate. We're just thrilled at the response. We 